It is the 12th of May, 2021. This is David Gauci. Dave Nagel and I welcome you to the fourth talk in the Business and Energy series of Forum 2100 for this year. As pressure mounts to address the climate change and energy challenges facing all of us, how can we prepare a new generation of decision makers to design and help us navigate the unfolding energy transitions around the world? That's the topic for today. We're delighted to have Dr. Tracy Holloway of the University of Wisconsin-Madison as our guest today. She and a panel of alumni will be examining the strategies and impacts of the Energy Analysis and Policy Program, a graduate certificate program, and its efforts to expand collaborations with the business community. Tracy Holloway is the Gaylord Nelson Distinguished Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, jointly appointed in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. She serves as the engagement lead for the EAP program that we shall be talking about today. Dr. Holloway also serves as the team lead for the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Science Team and is a co-founder and served as the first president of the Earth Science Women's Network and Science-a-thon. Dr. Holloway received her Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics from Brown University and a PhD in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences from Princeton University. Dr. Holloway, welcome to Forum 2100. We're delighted to have you as our guest today. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure to be here and such a wonderful opportunity to talk about the Energy Analysis and Policy Graduate Certificate Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Tracy Holloway and I'm a professor uh, at UW-Madison and the engagement lead for the EAP program, as we call it. And before we get started, I'd like to um, recognize a few key people who will be involved in today's presentation and in the leadership of our graduate program. One is Professor Rob Annex, who is our program chair, Colleen Schmidt, who made these excellent slides, and she is our engagement coordinator. Later in today's presentation, we'll also be hearing from Dr. Najwa Juhini and Conrad Farmer, who are both recent alumni of our energy program. Next slide, please. So for many students, when they're thinking about where to go to graduate school, they're faced with a dilemma. Do they go to graduate school in energy writ broad and get a master's or a PhD in a program focused on interdisciplinary energy issues? Or do they pursue a traditional master's or PhD program, whether that's policy or engineering, law or environmental studies, where they um, get a degree that, that connects with energy, but may not have that as its sole purpose. And we've encountered many times students who are at this crossroads. They're interested in energy, but may want for different reasons, including career planning or just because it's their core area of interest to connect with a traditional degree program. Next slide, please. So that's where our EAP graduate certificate comes in. We describe it as a T-shaped expertise where students get the depth of training in their degree program, often with a research thesis that goes along with that. Um, but then they connect with other fields, including students in other programs through the Energy Analysis and Policy Certificate. And this program has been going for over 40 years. And it's been such a success, I think, because our students get to balance the depth and breadth of expertise necessary for successful graduate training and necessary to engage in energy as a, as a field. Energy does not fit in one discipline or another. It's not a no real world problem is only chemistry or only business or only engineering. Um, energy, uh, like many real world problems, cuts across many fields and our students are coming out really well trained to tackle the challenges of today's energy transition. Next slide, please. 
So the way that we've structured EAP, it's as a graduate certificate. So students can add this on to their graduate degree, usually just by picking courses that count both for EAP and their degree program. So most students graduate in the same amount of time that they would have graduated even without EAP. Um, the courses that they take for their energy analysis and policy certificate um, ensure that they're covering the broad range of energy issues. Um, we have designed a wide range of networking opportunities, including field trips and events, so they can meet energy leaders, including our very uh, large and growing community of alumni. Um, we've been able to provide scholarships for students in the program and uh, professional development grants if they want to pursue uh, travel opportunities or other um, growth areas that pertain to energy. Next slide, please. One of the things we're so excited about EAP is how it's growing and changing and its incredible diversity. For the past five or so years, we've really had a focus on growing the program. And um, as you can see, we now have about 25 new students admitted each year. Uh, that leads to currently 50 EAP students in the program. And these students really come from all corners of the university. We have the largest representation of students from engineering, public policy, and environmental studies. But we also have students from many different colleges and uh, degree programs across campus. Of the students in the program, a little bit over half are women which I think is uh, really a great feature of the program. Often energy is <clears throat> under, has women as underrepresented in the field, and we're really pleased that women are over half of our program. We also have a very large um, community of international students. About a third of the graduate students in our program are from outside the United States. Next slide, please. So if a student were considering going to graduate school in energy, maybe they would love this T-shaped structure where they can pick their degree program and combine it with EAP. Um, but one of the things they may not know is all the resources that the University of Wisconsin-Madison has to offer in energy. Um, from uh, a nu our nuclear reactor on campus and the oldest solar energy lab in the world, to the top 10 list of CEOs and number one for Peace Corps uh, volunteers. You know, we really run the gamut of um, fields and strengths necessary to train tomorrow's energy leaders. Next slide, please. If you're listening to this and wanna get involved, we have a website, eap.wisc.edu. We have events both in person and online, which are open to the public. We have an active social media account and we have our engagement coordinator, Colleen Schmidt and her email is there and I welcome you to contact her anytime. Next slide, please. So I'm now gonna hand the floor over to uh, my colleagues. Najwa Juhini is principal consultant of energy efficiency and sustainability at Tetra Tech. She earned her PhD uh, with a focus on life cycle analysis applied to the healthcare services, as well as a certificate in energy analysis and policy, a certificate in business, environment, and social responsibility. And um, before that has her undergraduate and master's in mechanical engineering. Conrad Farmer will be speaking after Najwa. Uh, Conrad is a sustainability sourcing manager at T-Mobile. He earned his master's of business administration at University of Wisconsin-Madison, along with the EAP certificate and the certificate in business environment and social responsibility. And that came from a background in engineering at Purdue. So we're really thrilled to have both of these outstanding alums joining us. And with that, I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Juhini. Thank you, Tracy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, like Tracy mentioned, um, I earned my PhD degree from UW Madison. Uh, before that, I um, earned an inner engineer, my engineering degrees from University of Stuttgart. Um, those degrees were focused on energy to start with. I'm from the beginning. I was really interested in the energy sector and renewable energy systems in general. So that was 
how I got started. And um, so after graduating uh, with my master's degree, I, um, I worked for a few years as a design engineer, but I, I still wanted to go back to school. Um, one of the reasons why is I, I really wanted to expand my knowledge beyond engineering. I felt I could um, really, um, you know, um, bring more to the table if I can expand my knowledge. And I, I really also realized that to solve a current our current energy and environmental issue that are getting more and more complex, we really need um, to work as a team and we need to have multiple skills beyond our specialization. Um, so, and that's kind of what led me to UW Medicine. They have a really great PhD program. It's also interdisciplinary in nature. Um, so it, it really helped me, expose me to, um, you know, business and um, environmental science uh, as other great disciplines that I felt really complemented my previous background. But um, another thing that I found really interesting is the EAP program. Although I had um, strong um, engineering skills in the energy sector, I felt I was lacking um, exposure to the public policy, for example, which the EAP program offered. So th that really was draw me to the program. And uh, one other aspect also that I, I thought was really useful is and unique about it is the, the capstone uh, project. So at the end of um, the program, the last semester, um, it's a project that um, that uh, we that kind of a, it's a, a team project that students can work where students can work with the firm. Uh, it's an actual to solve an actual problem, which I, I thought that was really interesting that we get to really practice the knowledge that we just gained from the program and work in a cross-disciplinary team. So I worked with the policy students and um, in the team we had also a student from the business school and it really kind of gave me a taste of um, you know, my future career. And this is why I envisioned as um, you know, working in a project, a great project, um, dealing with energy and environmental issues, really working in cross functional team, knowing not just not having just the skills, but knowing how to communicate with people coming from a different background. And that that um, capstone project was really helpful. And even beyond that, for me personally, it really was kind of a the first stepping stone into my PhD research. It really helped me um, shape my research and make it as practical as possible and connected me with a firm that eventually funded my research, which was a really great um, opportunity for me. Um, another great aspect of the program is the connection with the alumni and all the networking opportunities. I think that was really a great uh, thing for me and it really led to my current uh, job right now. Um, I learned about this job through an, an alumni from the EAP program, which is really great. So uh, it's really a great program. Um, it, it, I learned so much from it and I'm applying all those skills right now every day. And uh, even in my current job now, I work with people from different backgrounds, even social scientists. So having that knowledge really helped me. Um, so yeah, and if you have any question, I'd be happy to share more about the program. I'll, uh, I think I'll stop there and uh, Conrad, it's um, your turn to share your experience. Sure, thanks Najwa. Uh, so my name is Conrad Farner. There's a little echo. All right, I think we're good. Um, so my name is Conrad Farner and I'm a sustainability sourcing manager at T-Mobile where I do kind of a, a variety of different things, including greenhouse gas accounting um, and, you know, target setting for our energy and climate commitments. Um, 
And really where it started is my undergraduate education was in environmental engineering um, and kind of a focus on sustainable energy within that. Um, and after graduating with that undergrad degree, I spent a couple of years in operational roles, uh, specifically focused on environmental health and safety. Um, and I, you know, gained a lot of experience in those roles and discovered there were parts of it that I really enjoyed, like working uh, with sustainability. And there are other parts that I didn't necessarily enjoy as much. And so that's what kind of led me uh, to decide I wanted to focus on the stuff that I did enjoy full time uh, and kind of pursue a graduate degree to do that. Uh, and with that engineering background, I knew I had, you know, kind of the technical skills in place to do a variety of different things. Uh, but I thought that having a graduate degree that was a little more broad and maybe focused on some of the things that I hadn't focused on as much, like soft skills, uh, working in teams, that kind of thing, would be beneficial for future opportunities. Uh, and that's what really kind of led me to deciding to get an MBA. Now, I researched several different programs, and some programs actually do offer uh, MBA concentrations in energy or environment, uh, something like that. Uh, or even like a dual degree where you get like a master's in environmental management or something. And those all really appealed to me. Uh, but I am from Wisconsin and had a lot of connections with Wisconsin. And I knew that uh, the Wisconsin School of Business would be a great fit for me. Unfortunately, the Wisconsin School of Business doesn't have one of those such concentrations. Uh, but that's when I discovered the EAP program. And it seemed like the perfect fit uh, to really complement the business school side of things with that focus and concentration. Uh, in energy and, you know, sustainable energy. And so, um, you know, like the quote says up there, uh, you know, I think EAP really moved the needle uh, for me when it came to attending a business school and even just deciding, you know, which business school I wanted to attend. Um, so I'll keep it short for now. And like Najwa said, happy to answer any questions after, uh, but I'll turn it back to Tracy. Thank you, Conrad and Najwa. That's uh, been, you know, it's so fun to hear what you're doing now and, and your thoughts looking back. Um, so I will um, hand it back to, um, to our hosts, but uh, again, welcome anyone, whether you're thinking about grad school or whether you're working in a company or an organization, you know, our goal is to build partnerships to help our great students find jobs and help organizations find next generation talent and um, showcase what Wisconsin has to offer for graduate students. So we're happy to be involved and connect on, on any topic. So um, with that, I will um, end our part of the presentation. Thank you, Tracy and Najwa and Conrad. Uh, quite interesting. I, I think you're, you're tackling a pretty tough problem actually uh, that universities have faced for, for a long time and in other and in a variety of domains. So you have got a, we've got a couple of questions for you. And uh, I think maybe there's one that goes right to the heart of what you're all about. I think this is called consilience. Um, this comes from Al Arisman, who was formerly uh, the director of R&D at the Boeing company. Uh, so he's sitting out there in Seattle listening to you. He's had quite a bit of ex uh, experience interacting and working with the other UW which is called UW, University of Washington. But he says, uh, one opportunity for interdisciplinary work is the refinement of particular disciplines in light of the way these disciplines come together in the solution of energy policy. Do you have examples of reshaping individual dis disciplines, for example, engineering or public policy based on the insights of how they come together? That's a tough one. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, maybe I'll I'll take that one uh, to to get us started. But um, Conrad and Najwa, please jump in uh, if you want to add on to this. Um, you know, I think that things are changing uh, so much. You know, maybe not year by year, but definitely decade by decade. Um, to about twenty years ago, when I was in graduate school, I was in a disciplinary program. Now, admittedly, my program was atmospheric and oceanic sciences. That in and of itself is interdisciplinary in that a lot of the professors in that field, when I was a graduate student, they had their PhDs in physics and math and chemistry. So I think one thing to keep in mind is just that in general, like things are moving toward interdisciplinary 
fields, and they have been for a long time, in that something that had been once just economics might spawn off into a public policy school and what might have been physics and chemistry merge into a meteorology program. And so I think there has been a track record of interdisciplinary movement and the launching of new fields for a long time. And, uh, but there still has been in each discipline often kind of a feeling of, um, of, uh, defining what is and is not part of the discipline. And, you know, sometimes that you have to make decisions on who do you hire for a job in a university department, or if you're a funding organization, what counts as eligible for funding. So some of those decisions on what counts and what doesn't count have emerged from kind of practical constraints. But I think more and more um, uh, universities are realizing that there is a, a, a need to be open-minded because new questions are emerging all the time. And most real world questions, and I think energy is, is a prime example, do not fit solely in the jurisdiction of the chemistry department or solely in the jurisdiction of the electrical engineering department or solely in the department of the policy or economy, economics department. And so, you know, as, as funding opportunities arise to support interdisciplinary work, as um, journals arise to publish interdisciplinary work, as top students come in interested in interdisciplinary work, there is a push uh, for all disciplines to be more open-minded in terms of what counts for their dis department. And I have seen across Wisconsin and, and across the United States, so many examples of programs that are willing to take a bigger, perspective and and benefit from that bigger perspective. And you know, I'll just I'll just note um, I gave a talk at the University of Illinois and they had all these amazing new faculty in their civil engineering department, many of whom didn't have degrees that said engineering on them, but instead might, for example, come from my field of atmospheric science. But recognizing that, you know, engineering and atmospheric science really share so many goals and methodologies that that's, you know, one example in public policy here at Wisconsin. We just hired a fantastic uh, professor named Morgan Edwards. And she has her PhD in engineering and public policy from MIT. And she's doing kind of scientific analysis driven by policy relevant problems. And so now she's in our public policy school. So, you know, I think that this is a trend that one could trace back many decades, but as there is a demand opportunity and resources all departments are going to see benefits to broadening their self-definition of what fits. Very good, thank you very much. Um, one of the other things I think um, is apparent about the program that you have described is that it comes from uh, within a very large and a very prestigious institution, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Do you think there are other kinds of uh, institutions, um, because I know there are a number of people here from smaller schools, uh, universities and colleges who are listening in, um, opportunities that, that they could pursue or they could do something along the lines of an EAP, or are there certain resources that they would need to have to try to gather and uh, be creative about in order to do something like this? Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I think that the, 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 the challenge of supporting the energy uh, is so vast that there's so many opportunities and no type of university has a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the handle on all, all corners of the issue. And, you know, and plus, you know, some people wanna be in a, one environment. Not everybody wants to move to Wisconsin, even though it's a great place to move to. And you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities on, on all sides. Um, you know, I think to me, one of the biggest issues is just making sure that the partnerships are in place. Like we have benefited tremendously from connecting, like Dave Nagel came and gave a talk uh, to our graduate students about his experiences working at BP. And I think that wherever you are having um, experts come in, um, an exchange of ideas, exposing students to the skills, the methods, the connections they need to 
understand the landscape of energy. I think that's something that that is that anyone that any type of organization can do to build those relationships. And I think that you know this. If there's one thing the past year has taught us, it's that we can get a lot done through Zoom and uh, digital engagement, which I do, I think also kind of opens opens the playing field to organizations that may not have all the experts just on campus um, to do what they want to do. Um, but you know, I, I think that there's that there are strengths of a big university and strengths of smaller universities and colleges. And, and I think part of it is sort of figuring out what is your strategic advantage and playing to that strategic advantage. And I think here at Wisconsin, one of our advantages is that we have all these different departments who are working on different angles of the energy issue. And to some degree, that can be a weakness if people don't know, well, where do I turn for energy? You know, there's so many players, it can be confusing, uh, it can be overwhelming. And so I think to some degree, trying to make a front door to make this mm. breadth into a strength and a clarity of purpose for incoming students interested in energy, as opposed to being kind of overwhelming and, and um, hard to track. Right. So um, you mentioned this, this program has been around for 40 years, which is, I have to say, quite impressive. Um, what, uh, can you shed some light on what themes and practices are essentially unchanged over these 40 years that have elapsed and which ones have you had to actually adjust and what new territory are you having to sort of explore now? Yeah, it's been so interesting to kind of look back at the history of those 40 years of history. I've been there for about half of that history. Um, but, you know, early on, the program was intended to be an add-on only to a couple different programs. I think it was um, our uh, environmental studies graduate program and urban planning graduate program, maybe one other. Um, so one of the big changes has been the fact that really now energy connects with almost every department on campus, whether that's you know, uh, uh, regional studies programs or journalism, uh, economics, I mean, you, you name it, and atmospheric science, you, you, it's really, you know, you can draw a link through so many. So now it's open to students in just about every program on campus. And, you know, I think that's been one of the big changes. Another thing that change that we've made uh, more recently has been to, um, well, over time, I'd say the number of credits required for EAP have been declining. And that's partly actually to, to um, Al, uh, Al's question earlier about how disciplines are changing. I think that's also because disciplines are allowing for more real world cross-cutting interdisciplinary um, scholarship within their um, regular programs to some degree, it's lightening the load on what we have to, you know, make sure our students know. Mm. And I, early on, I, I think that it was a 40 credit program. And then for a long time, it was an 18 credit program. Now it's a 13 credit program because we, we don't want the number of credits to be a barrier for students not thinking about energy as part of their graduate programs. These are all students who are already admitted into graduate degree programs and often doing work with an energy focus even within their programs. So we're trying to be the connective tissue to pull them together. So I think that our role has changed um, over the years, even though the, the core element of addressing interdisciplinary energy analysis and policy questions in a way that's an add-on to other degree programs has stayed the same. Can you share with us uh, perhaps um, where you get your funding and to what extent funding really is an issue for you? You know, I, I would love to talk about that and I will, but maybe I'll pass that to um, Conrad and Najwa. Maybe they can talk a little bit about how they've seen the funding issue from the perspective of the students. And then I'll zoom out to the, to the program side. Conrad, you wanna start okay. that one? Sure. And my perspective might be a little different coming from the business school. Uh, you know, I know a lot of EAP students, uh, you know, are in master's or PhD programs uh, and, you know, it requires funding to continue those and pursue those. 
Um, and so, you know, in a sense, I think in the past, people might have seen uh, maybe a graduate certificate that takes time away from that is, you know, something that isn't really supported uh, in terms of, you know, the financial component. Um, but I think it's been, I think a big push has kind of been, you know, to help support students uh, pursue the EAP certificate, uh, you know, both in terms of, you know, academic support as well as financial support. And I think Tracy and the team have done a great job, uh, you know, coming up with uh, scholarships and other types of awards that can really help, uh, you know, convince sometimes. But again, at this point, they probably don't even need convincing. It's just that little extra push that can really uh, make the difference for students to decide to participate. Yes, and to share my perspective, for me, I was fortunate that I had a, a teaching assistant throughout my PhD. So given that I had some experience already through my bachelor's and master's in engineering, uh, I was able to uh, get funding throughout my PhD. But uh, to uh, Tracy's point, the, the, with the, the number of credit not being a burden on student, I think that was a great point. That was one of the things I considered, you know, I already have a master's and bachelor's degree and a PhD now, and I had another certificate on focused on corporate sustainability. So do I really need an EAP program on top of everything else? But the fact that first, the flexibility of the program and the way that I could tailor it to what I need, you know, kind of looking at the gaps in my education and knowledge and, you know, targeting those courses um, and also not being a burden, you know, 13 credits, and I was able to include some of the previous courses in the program, count them towards the program. And what really kind of encouraged me, like the, the last push um, was the capstone program I mentioned, the, uh, the capstone project I mentioned earlier. That was really what I thought really a project that really brought a lot of value and uh, really encouraged me to pursue the EAP program. The, the, being able to work on a real problem and work with the, connect with the company and practice kind of uh, what I've been learning throughout the years and work with people from different backgrounds. I think that was kind of the, the last selling point for me to, to pursue this. So. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons I'm so happy we have both Conrad and Najwa here is because I think that actually the funding issues fundamentally relates to the diversity of students we have in our program. And when you think about, uh, from, from my perspective, there are really like four reasons that we have to think about funding. And one is funding for students, two for faculty, three for activities, that we do and four for staff. And, um, and so I think that understanding what students want out of a graduate program and what they need out of a graduate program is really what's been driving our thinking about where should we be getting money from? Where <laughs> should we be spending the money that we're getting? And so I think point one is to recognize that some students are coming to graduate school and paying their own way. And for those students, the number one goal is for them to get connected with career opportunities it's the minute they graduate. They have loans to pay back. Uh, they're trying to figure out where are they gonna get the most bang for their buck. And for those students, you know, we've really designed EAP to maximize their professional connections and to some degree double their career opportunities when they graduate because they have the energy credential now and those careers, plus whatever their main degree program would have provided. A different category of students who are students who are coming in who are sort of research students. Those are often PhDs, but often master's students as well. And those students may be funded on a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship. And those students you know, may not be um, as uh, uh, immediately thinking about what's my job because they may be thinking about a research career. But those students too, you know, then how are they gonna contextualize the research that they're doing? How are they gonna say like why it matters or pitch a proposal to uh, a, a grant making organization later in their career? And for those students, we feel like EAP is giving them kind of the real world perspective on how their education fits 
with broader topics. And the fact that you have these two communities of students who are passing each other on the sidewalks and the halls every day, they usually don't interact with each other at all. So the fact that the EAP student is bringing together the professional students and the research students together is in and of itself, one of, I think, one of our most exciting aspects. So when, when we think about funding for students, one of the priorities that we're trying to do is to think about how can we broaden this community and incentivize students, whether they're the professional students or the research students, to add on a few extra credits and be part of our community. And what we've um, been doing is to launch a scholarship program with philanthropic support where we're giving scholarships of $2,500. Now, this is not enough to sway a student who's not interested in energy into energy, but it's just enough to put it on the radar of a student who this would be a good fit for. And most of the students who take these often say that they would have done EAP anyway, uh, but actually most of them probably wouldn't have thought of doing it if they hadn't seen the scholarship announcement. So we find a huge return on investment from these small scholarships to incentivize participation in our program, first of all. For our faculty, most of our faculty are participating out of the goodness of their heart. There was a big initiative a number of years ago to hire in energy. I was hired in this. And so I really feel like this is part of my mission at the university, um, but I'm not getting, uh, but I have the freedom to choose how I spend my time. And I spend it on EAP because I think it's such a phenomenal program. And that's typical of the faculty. We do, um, have support for our chair and we try to have support for faculty who are giving major investments in some of our classes. Um, and that comes from support from the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and from the Wisconsin Energy Institute. Those are the two institutes that are supporting us. Um, but you know, we don't fit into the typical structure of degrees and you know class sizes. Mm -hmm. Like we're this unusual add-on program. So we're always trying to make the case of why we are a good use of funds. Um, that brings me to, I'll just say our staff and the support from the Wisconsin Energy Institute and the Nelson Institute support our staffing right now. And, um, and finally to our events. And with our events, we take, we take our students to Chicago, we host social events, we host these scholarship programs, travel awards, and that's really coming from philanthropy. So we're really working to build, um, the to make every donated dollar go to the maximum benefit, both to support students and to train leaders for energy. So we're hoping that corporations or individuals who are interested in getting involved see this as a really good return on investment, so to speak, but return on you know donated investment by making the world a better place. Uh, well, quite impressive. Um, EAP, the uh, Nelson Institute and so forth, you're really biting off quite a bit here. And this is uh, a domain that seems to be remarkably dynamic. Uh, there's a lot of, there's enhanced uh, attention to it right now, it would seem, yeah, certainly from the US administration uh, and a lot of the proposed legislation that's being debated. Um, so where is everything going and where do you think EAP is going over the next five years? Or do you see particular things that you need to do or be prepared for opportunities or challenges that you need to note? And um, how can you inspire us in that way? Yeah. So, you know, I think that um, we are operating kind of with this feeling that uh, success breeds success. We're trying to, you know, we know that any system is a nonlinear uh, uh, system where um, there are inputs and outputs. And, you know, for us, our biggest uh, product is our amazing graduates like Najwa and Conrad. And we realized that the, play, the way to get on the radar of employers and agencies and companies is to be highlighting the amazing quality of these students coming out of our program. And again, they're not just in one program, but these cut across like all the programs at the university. So, um, so we have a unique role, I'd say, in kind of workforce development. And I think we want to be viewed by employers as a great place to seek out top quality talent. And if students see that this is a great, that this is a very good pathway for employment prospects, then that's a great way to be attracting more 
excellent students. So part of it is, you know, just building this pipeline to attract students who are interested in energy and then showcase all these amazing students to employers. But between the inflows of the students and the outflows for their successful careers, we want EAP to be a shining star in their graduate experience. We want them to look back on experience like Najwa mentioned with the capstone, working with a real world team and organization and company and really feel like that was transformative. And, you know, I guess maybe I'd like to pitch this to Conrad and Najwa. When you look back at EAP in your graduate uh, experience, like are there, is there a memory that jumps out or something that you feel like is something that you would, you know, tell a story about if you were talking to somebody thinking about the program? Maybe Najwa, you go first. I can try to answer that. There's so many uh, good memories. Um, but I guess um, kind of going back to the capstone, I, I think really that um, was especially, uh, it's, it's really a great experience for me just because of how it shaped my PhD moving forward that kind of led to my current job. So that, that was for me one of the great experiences in the, the program. Um, but on top of that, I think all those networking and, you know, happy hours, opportunities, those are all great memories. I mean, I still am in touch with students that I wouldn't have met um, if I haven't participated in this program. So um, I'm really fortunate that I, I, I now know people, you know, like you said, like we have people from, I know people who are chemists and, um, you know, you know, business and public policy. I, I know actually quite a few now who are um, end up in really great jobs and they work in, in Washington, D.C. And like I, I, I never thought I would have worked with people like that. And that's great. I mean, and those connections are still there. And um, I think it's really it's through the, the program that we were able to build those relationships and maintain them through you know, events that happen even after we leave the program. I think that's great. Yeah, and just to echo that, you know, coming from the MBA program, a lot of MBAs can be kind of siloed just into the business school. And I just think it was so valuable, you know, going beyond the business school, getting to know students in engineering and, uh, you know, other public affairs and other degrees. Um, it really added so much value to my experience. And like Najwa said, I loved kind of just getting to know these people on a personal level as well. I mean, those are the memories that I think will stick with me. Uh, and then obviously all the professional benefits that have happened and will continue happening as we go along. Well, Tracy, Najwa, and Conrad, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, but this has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, and I think it's actually maybe just the beginning uh, but I hope will be a protracted discussion that you may have with a number of the people who are in the audience today, as well as with Dave Nagel and me. So thank you very much for being with us. And as always, uh, thank you to all of you in the audience. Uh, now, within a day or so, uh, you will be able to find a recording of the session, including the presentation and the uh, Q&A on the Forum 2100 uh, website and in, on the Forum 2100 YouTube channel. So please take an opportunity to visit the website to the Forum 2100 website to view the archives of all of our sessions. And please pass the word to others you think might have interest in working uh, or following the work of Forum 2100. As this is our last session before the summer break, we shall be back in touch with all of you in early September to inform you of our two remaining sessions during the fall term. So please be looking for a formal announcement in your, in your inbox. Tracy, Najwa, Conrad, thanks again. We really enjoyed the presentation today. And to all of you, Dave Nagel and I thank you for attending the session and we wish you a pleasant, healthy and safe summer. <laughs>